market research tips and tricks. Click over here so it knows that I'm, there we go. So why do market research? And this is one of the things, if you sit down and have a one-on-one -on -one client session with me, this is kind of where I start. I need to know about your market, your client, your information to be able to provide you that better counseling session um, to help guide you in the areas that you need to look or do that's specific to your business. So when we talk about why do market research, and this kind of applies to whether you're looking at diversifying your business, extending into a new geographic region, not just necessarily only to government contract, but market research is essential to understanding your customer and your competition. We gotta know what's going on around us. It allows a company to make those informed decisions. Market research can identify trends that affect sales and profitability. Good market research can increase your success rate and it is an effective use of your business development time and money such as do you need staff and additional resources, projects coming up, those project management considerations, the equipment allocation. Uh, if you're in the construction, what is your bonding capacity? How quickly are you going to tie it up into your construction season? So all of those things that we need to make a decision on if we know what's coming up and and what the potential opportunity are, and we know what's going on in our market, and we know how to look up that information, it makes the decision-making process that much simpler. So the first tip that I'm gonna have is, well, what information do you need? I don't know how many of you have, you know, sat down on Facebook or Instagram or, uh, any of those others and you think, oh, I just want to quick look up somebody, I want to find a person, maybe even LinkedIn, and next thing you know, you're, oh, that's interesting, and you just kind of follow that trail of one after the other, and then you've spent, in my case, especially later in the evening, where I've spent a couple hours watching a whole bunch of stuff, and honestly, I don't even remember what I started my search for, or I didn't even become close to finding out what it was that I was looking for. Before we really start digging into this, we need to know what are you looking for? And you want to be specific. Like that photo of the target there where we have the white, black, blue, red, and yellow. If we just start and we're looking at that, well, I want business opportunities. That's pretty broad. I wanna do business with the government. Well, the government is vast. What layer, what level, which agency, what location, um, so what we need is to really define right now, what am I looking for? Those target points, what is our search goal? Why are we even sitting at the computer doing this process? What are we looking for? How, what is the search term? What is it that we're looking for? How are we defining that? So depending on the database, what type of data elements and how are those data elements defined and do we need to have those ready and lined up when we're going in to do the search? And of course, then there are those databases. Where are we going to do the search? Uh, where are we going to start? The nice thing about the world of federal contracting is that because the federal government is spending tax-based income, there is a requirement for transparency for federal spending. So with, except for, you know, uh, deemed national security or other reasons, I would say well over 95% of federal dollars spent is available for purview. We can go in to the federal procurement data system and we can look up that contract history. And if we're looking up history of a civilian agency, we can see that data within 24 to 48 hours of that contract word being executed. Unfortunately, with Department of Defense, there's about a quarter lag uh, before, while that information is kind of filtered out and then it's still manually. So the return on the information for the federal, for the Department of Defense is a little bit behind that curve. Uh, but a lot of the civilian agencies really do have that built into their contract software. So we have pretty current, all things, even that's three month old, we have relevant data, we have current data, and we can go in and search it. But again, that's so much to search. We really need to define our target. So let's talk a minute about kind of what is that, what information is needed. 
Well, if we're looking at a solicitation that we're interested in, maybe we want to know what is the solicitation history? Who was the incumbent? What was the spending history for that particular solicitation? Can we go in and see what, you know, were there a lot of modifications? Was a lot of money deobligated? What was the cash flow for that particular project? Who's the contracting officer? What's the history on that? Well, now let's take a look at that aging, the agency and spending history. Now, some agencies have that, their budgets are more accessible than others. But again, if you're in the construction region, we're going to talk about the Department of Defense and their construction budget websites really break those big projects down. Um, not the littler, you know, that we might see released as task orders under existing IDIQ, but for some of the big projects, those are budgeted well out in advance. And we can go into those spending sites for the Department of Defense, and we can see the project spending by, by base location. Uh, so DOD, again, that level of transparency, and that's really well-defined even before the civilian agencies are gonna have um, guarantee of what their budget is looking like, and if they're gonna get all the funds requested. So there are those budgets, the spending history, budget websites, and then of course we have agency spending forecasts. And every year they come out, most of them were usually out by the first part of November, because of course we have that new fiscal year start on October 1st. So each agency is required by Code of Federal Regulations to post upcoming forecast information so that the general public can be better prepared to respond to those solicitations. So we're gonna talk a bit about that too, because we can look at those forecasts. Some agencies even use those forecasts as a live working document, and we can go in and from month to month see um, has that been awarded uh, and look at the different information going on because unfortunately that funding for throughout a fiscal year is fluid. And sometimes there's additional funds and sometimes there's emergencies and all unallocated funds get pulled back up. Great example of that was about Oh, five years ago. Anybody else, when you start to try to figure out what year, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, pre-COVID days, what year was that? Uh, looking backwards, but about five years ago, we had just a record-breaking fire uh, season here in Alaska. And I was working with one of the contracting officers in the Forest Service, and they had, uh, there was a lot of fire down uh, Copper River, Soldatna area, and because they had to spend so much on fighting that fire, all of those unallocated funds, and this is in May, uh, June, were pulled back up until that fire budget could be resolved and then whatever money was left over went back over. So there was a lot of information on the forecast uh, and those projects didn't happen because that urgency changed. So it's something to keep in mind when we're looking at forecasts, federal funding is, if it actually comes through for that particular contract and isn't pulled out for a higher priority project. So we want to talk about those potential primes and subs, and there's some great databases where we can look at to kind of find that information before we actually even then do our due diligence on looking up those potential primes and those potential subcontractors or any other level of teaming partner that you're looking for. And of course, we have agency information because if we are going to do business with one particular agency, it's worth the time to do the research on that particular agency and find out, well, what type of language, what type of urgency do they have? Uh, what is the terminology? You know, if it is important for them, important enough for them to post that on their website and even at breaking it down by region, then maybe that's something that we should be looking at so we are understanding those agencies' um, primary focus. And then of course, what is your market and who are your competitors? But sometimes again, you know, we're looking at that big target and all those circles, it's a lot of data and where do you start? And occasionally, if you're looking at your direct competitor or even with a prime that you're thinking about teaming with, or if you're coming in from a subcontractor process, you know, who are the agencies that they're looking at? And fortunately for federal data, all of that is in FPDS. So we can even see their contract award history as well. 
And so we're going to talk a bit about that. So again, think about those target points. What is our search goal? What are the search terms that we need? And which database do we want to start with to find that information? Questions, anybody? Comments? That was a lot of discussion for one slide. All right. So let's start with talking about identifying your market. And this is a slide I've used quite a bit. I pulled it out of uh, a textbook, actually, Principles of Marketing. Uh, you can see the version 2.0, and there's the information on that. Uh, but it was a marketing uh, class with the university. And I kind of liked this flow chart when we start by identifying your market. Again, if I'm working with a client and they're kind of entering that government contracting arena, it's like, well, who are your clients now? You know, what is that commercial counterpart or who are your commercial clients? And then we can go in and flip that and say, well, where is that governmental counterpart? So if we're looking at our current customers, our potential customers, and again, doing that market research, and this is really from a commercial standpoint, but it's all applicable when we are then going to zoom in on just looking at potential customers in the government contracting arena. So there's a lot of information, mission statement, strategy, organization. Remember that was, I said, we can find all of that right on the agency's websites, even down to those region websites where all of that is there. You know, what offerings to fulfill co consumer needs? Again, doing that research. So this little flow chart is kind of a good way of taking your commercial clients and tweaking that thinking to what are those government counterparts. So let's think of a few market research questions. Because again, if you're like, I don't really know where to start. And it's like a few questions here to kind of help us pull in that target. So you're going to be doing your marketing. And we're going to use pause here because let me redirect real quick. The word market can be both a verb and noun. So if we're talking about market research versus marketing. So what we're doing now when we say market research, we're talking about, again, our business community, our business environment in which we're going to do commerce. If we talk about marketing, we're talking about the active process of promoting, uh, letting the your commercial area know that your business is available and you have these products to sell and you provide these services. So we're going to kind of hop back and forth, but I just want to take a moment to clarify that because in this, it gets a little confusing sometimes. So when we're marketing with the ING, we are actually promoting. This is us talking to someone else. But the market research is giving us the data we need to decide who do we want to reach out and talk to. Okay, so are you going to market locally? So again, this is our verb. Will you market to local, state, or federal agencies? So we're talking geographic region, and then we're talking about which branch of government are we going to reach out to. So which agencies or departments purchase your project? Who are the buyers? So again, if we're talking about these questions, it's like, hmm, which database should I align those to? So which agencies or departments purchase your product? Well, we know we can pull into FPDS. And by using those NAICS code, that North American Industrial Classification System, we can do a search because that's going to help us identify our product or service, and we can go in and see who's buying. We can kind of start filtering that down by location. Who are the buyers? Uh, the nice thing about looking at data in FPDS is it's going to state who is the contracting officer that at least entered the data into FPDS, and usually you can see the awarding contracting officer as well. So how often do they buy and what frequency? and what quantity. So that's where we again can take that FPDS and we're going to kind of strip that back and say, well, when is does this contract expire? Is it a multi-year? Is it a single year? Was it a purchase order? Was it a task order against an IDIQ contract? And then we can follow that data back and we can kind of get an idea of the cycle for that particular kind of activity. And if we see a lot of buys for that particular NAICS code by a singular agency, then we can tell frequency and demand. And again, we can do some research and find out specifically what it is. So are future buys anticipated? And this is kind of one of those things that if we are seeing a need 
such as I'm going to use janitorial or snow removal because they're pretty consistent throughout, that if we can see a long history, if they've gone back, you know, 10, 15 years, that they're consistently contract after contract for those services, then the odds of that forward application for the next 15 years are most likely as well. So are there going to be future buys? Absolutely, we can see that from the history. If we're seeing a few odd and end purchases, well, either we need to refine our data that we're searching, or it could just be a kind of a one-off on that whole data point of what the agency is really buying. And I am going to show you all of this, um, not just to kind of talk about it in a big lofty manner and then not show you how to actually do that. This wouldn't that be frustrating. All right, so which contracts are due to expire, to be rebid or terminated? Again, that information is out there. What is the dollar amount contracts in your industry? We can kind of see that just based on the spending. And again, what resources will be needed to complete the government mark to compete in the government marketplace? That second to last bullet, this is where we're talking about when I say what resources will be needed to compete, this is now shifting. We've done our research, so we can say we've done the research in these bullets up to this point, and we can see kind of the frequency. We have an idea, we're looking at a solicitation. And then when we're talking about what resources will be needed, this is kind of back in to redirecting our target and breaking that down. We'll come back to this one in a little bit. And then why did the government buy that particular product and service? So again, that's kind of about looking back at the solicitation and looking at those evaluation criteria. Comments, questions, guys, again, feel free to throw something in the question and answer box or raise your hand. So search criteria, and I've used this poor slide for so long and for so many different things. And if you guys take the bid match webinar, you're going to get to see this exact slide again, because that building that search criteria is probably one of the biggest tips that I can tell you when that knowing what you're searching for is how is that data delineated, defined and categorized so we know what language or what term or what code to use when we're looking for that data. So keywords, NAICS codes, product service codes, federal supply groups, those unique entity identifiers. We'll take a look at those when we get into SAM. And of course, the DODAX, the Department of Defense Activity Address Codes. And you can actually pull up a list of all registered DODACs and search that. There's a website, a DOD website where you can search up either by doing a reverse, I have this DODAC, where is it located, or doing by a geographic area and then dialing in to find that particular DODAC. So if you're curious, uh, just a real quick definition for the DODAC, when you're looking at a solicitation or a contract, that first five, six character string is that activity address code. Uh, and it's going to always be the same for that physical location of that particular contracting office. And as the federal government has gone through cycles of, you know, each location should have its own local center for procurement to know it'll save us money to centralize all of our contracting staff and it becomes regional offices um, and at different dollar points, depending on the size and the scale, uh, that might be a headquarters purchase if it's a national contract or if the dollar value is large enough. So knowing those and understanding how those DODACs work and looking that up can, can also tell us more about that contract activity. Okay, so kind of we talked about why, why a business should conduct market research. Let's talk about the how. So those federal opportunities, and when we start with market research, the easiest start point is to hop onto contract opportunities and say, what is the government buying right here and now? And I would say in contract opportunities, the archive, you know, when it's past that bid due date, usually after 15 days past the bid due then date, that solicitation is deemed inactive and it kind of goes into their archives. So we can go back up to 
Uh, it's better than it used to be with FedBizOp, so the archive is still pretty searchable if you're looking for inactive opportunities, but we can still find that information. But the nice thing is, again, we have, after anything over that three-month period, we have that federal procurement data system that we can go into. But starting with that contract opportunity and starting with our keywords or NAICS codes, we can start just doing a generalized search. And generally, I would say start broad and then start looking for place performance. And we are going to play with this. And also state of Alaska opportunities. So for all of the things that we're talking about for federal, the state of Alaska does have the state of Alaska checkbook. And it does offer similar information on transparency. It's just not as robust of data, um, but you can get a general idea of where the state's spending and where those contracts are going. And then of course we have municipal and borough opportunities. Now there is no transparency requirement for um, municipal or borough. And so unfortunately there really is not a good database for doing that past market research. On the plus side, when you're talking about starting on a borough level or your city of, um, is it's a much, much smaller contracting officer uh, office, usually one or two staff uh, for the purchasing officers. And it's a lot easier than to build that relationship as opposed to reaching out to the joint base, Elmendorf Richardson, not to the Jaybird 673rd, where you know we have 30 to 40 rotating contracting officers, some that are the civilian and some are enlisted, and getting to learn that constant changeover of who's who in the contracting office. All right, so let's just start with the federal. So we're gonna do some in-depth on the different processes and the databases for federal, and then we're gonna go into the state, and then we're gonna talk about some municipal and borough opportunities, but really we are gonna spend the rest of the bulk of the time now talking about federal. So one of the easiest things for a start point, we, again, we mentioned we can go into contract opportunities, we can see what current solicitations are posted, but we can also hop over to USA Spending and all of the data that's in USA Spending is fed into that website through the federal procurement data system. So the USA Spending doesn't have any more data than FPDS, it's just formatted differently so you can kind of see the big picture um, analysis. So what this gives us is that whole, where is the money going? What is the spending trend for the federal government? And we can go over and look at this by geographic location. So I went into USA Spending and I pulled this over last night and I went in under the spending analysis and I asked for time, and I, you can see I put in the, 20, the time period from 2018 to end of this fiscal year, 2022, for the state of Alaska. So we can kind of see this highlight and this increase, decrease for federal spending. Now, what we have in here now is really probably only the first half for fiscal year 22, because again, we're in that third quarter, there's still those final fin funds to be allocated and spent. And we have that delay in reporting, of course, from DOD spending on a national level. But that does give us an idea of the money moving through the state. And this can be really helpful, especially since uh, we're gonna start seeing more and more projects coming out of that uh, infrastructure, the Invest, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the IIJA bill and the funds for those projects. And we might not see them so much as visualized or coming out as federal projects, but where we're gonna really see and where this site is handy is where that money is flowing to on a state level. So we can see state of Alaska, we're gonna see the different programs under the state, Department of Education, Department of Transportation, we're gonna start seeing large dollar amounts move here in FPD, or I'm sorry, in USA spending, we'll be able to see those that money transition into the state. Uh, and then we can kind of know that these projects are gonna start showing up on state spending websites. The nice thing about this site that we really don't talk about much, especially from a PTAC perspective, is where are the grant money's flowing as well. 
Now, obviously, I don't have it in this particular screenshot, but we can go into USA Spending and poke around so I can show you that information as well. Because when we talk about government, we often forget about some of the authorities. And an authority is pseudo government. So basically what they are is more of a, and I'm gonna use this term loosely, so bear with me, more of a privately funded, not pure commercial, but they do have a federal board or they have federal or state, they have a governmental oversight at a board level to ensure that they're meeting uh, all requirements for the purpose of that entity. So examples of authorities are the Alaska Railroad, uh, the water utility, Anchorage Water and Wastewater Utility is an authority. We have housing authorities. I think there's like 56 across the state housing authorities uh, that receive those federal funds from um, HUD, Housing and Ur Urban Development. There are, uh, we have the Mission, uh, Missile Command Center in Kodiak that is also an authority. So there are entities that are receiving these federal funds. They do have federal obligations and requirements when they receive these funds and how they are spent, but in of themselves, they are kind of self-actualization, self-running sub-entities for government. Okay, sorry, long explanation. This site, though, is one of the best places to see where those funds are flowing through from that federal down to a state level um, through various different grants. And so we can kind of take an idea, uh, take a look and see where the money is flowing to because quite simply, this isn't like they get to take this money and pocket it for future need. It's money that has to be spent now, that whole use it or lose it concept. So they've requested the funds, they've already had their projects identified, complete with budgets to be able to receive those funds. Once those funds flow, those projects are going to be put out for a contract, they're gonna be awarded and that those projects are gonna begin. Whew. All right, let me get back on track. So just a quick snapshot of government databases, uh, even though we're gonna kind of dig into it, I just wanted to give you an idea at what's out there. So we talked about SAM, the system for award management, and this is where we're gonna find that contract opportunities. You've seen the FPDS, the Federal Procurement Data System, uh, the dynamic small business search, and often people forget about this, uh, the information from the DSBS, dynamic small business search, most of it's downloaded for SAM, but there's additional marketing data that's entered in DSBS um, that you don't enter in SAM. The value of using this for a search point is for the end result of the business list, or not phrasing things well today. The point of using the dynamic small business search is that when we go in, we're looking for businesses and the search results are only going to show us small business no large businesses, no not-for-profit organizations or universities, it's only gonna return with small business. So if you're looking at a set-aside of zone 8A and you are not eligible for that particular set-aside and you're looking for a partner, DSBS is a great place to start. All right, we have acquisition.gov. This is kind of the best start point for when we're talking about uh, agency reoccurring procurement forecast. Almost all of these civilian agencies have a link listed in acquisition.gov, so it gives us a one place start to go in and find those forecasts. We have uh, GSA's Federal Acquisition Services, the schedule, their mass, their multiple award schedules. You hear everybody talking about a GSA schedule. Well, this data to decisions, this is their revitalized uh, schedule sales query. You can kind of still see it in the link here. Because if you want to see, if you, especially if you're looking at, well, how much of these contracts are going through GSA versus being pushed into the contract opportunities where they're kind of that uh, more full and open, or even if they're set aside, they're still open to all app qualifying businesses where anything that's posted on GSA's GSA Advantage are only going to be accessible to schedule holders. So there's a lot of contract opportunity. And we can even go into FPDS and find those GSA contracts too. And of course, the State of Alaska checkbook. All right, anyone have any questions, comments? 
All right. Just double check, make sure I'm not missing anybody. All right, let's go ahead and keep going then. At this point in time, um, if you guys want, if there's things that you want me to look up and use as examples when we start getting into the databases themselves, feel free to throw that into the question box. Uh, so if you're looking for construction or A&E or paving or any of those type of, uh, feel free to give me some keywords to get started. So we got just a couple more slides and then we're going to get right into those databases. All right, so moving on, and this is kind of how it's all linked. So I had a screenshot here. Okay, hey, look, we have all these data, but this is what I'm going to show you today because a part of this whole tip in tricks is understanding how that data flows and how it, how it is all linked. So we've kind of already talked about those agency budget sites, uh, agency forecasts, the agency websites itself. Talk about SAM because it has those contract opportunities, SBA's dynamic small business search because we're looking for that business data, that USA spending that's going to show us where the money is flowing to, um, that's going to both have both past contract plus some future contract because the grant info. And of course, that's all pulled from um, FPDS. Let me rephrase that. So USA spending doesn't have budget, it doesn't have forward, forward spending money. I misstated that. Because the information is feeding from FPDS to USA spending, those are all considered award data. So it's already spent, it's allocated. When we were talking about the grants, it just means the grant was awarded, allocated to the government, those state and local entities, and then those entities yet have then to come out and potentially start their spending cycle just to kind of clarify that. So no future budget in USA spending, unless we're thinking about those grant awards and the recipients might not have yet started that procurement process in order to spend those award monies that they've just received. All right, so I kind of already mentioned this, and again, anybody want to throw out some keywords, put them in the question box, raise your hand, give me a, uh, where do you want to start? And I'm going to do this as a first come, first serve. Emergency signaling devices. Thanks, Kim. Woohoo, we're going to use that as our example. Okay, so this is just a screenshot that I pulled last night again. I just went in. You can see I have contract opportunities that are in the SAM.gov. I selected my dam domain and I just threw Alaska as a keyword so I could grab a quick screenshot. What you can't see, it's cut off below the screen. As I said, just things that were uh, had update this week. I just wanted to capture what's new this week. And you can see I've got 40 results. So we have a capture. So if we're looking at this data, I'm then going to go into one of these solicitations and I'm going to start following those arrows down to pull the data from SAM to FPDS, possibly to USA spending, depending on what I'm looking at. Um, usually I go from SAM to FPDS down to the dynamic small business search or back to SAM so I can get contractor data. And then if I might want to know more about the agency, then I kind of cycle back to, well, what's that agency been receiving and really looking at those agency websites. And honestly, I say this a lot and I think it's underutilized for businesses that really want to build a good relationship with the federal agencies, do the research, go on the agency websites, and see what they're talking about. All right, and then my next goes into state. So let's get out of PowerPoint for a bit. And let's start here, just as I had mentioned, so SAM. Now, the one thing with SAM, when we're doing a search, you can come in here and search for contract opportunities without being signed in. Honestly, it's my experience that if you do take the time to sign in before, set up your username, your password, get that all in there, you tend to get cleaner search results. Or if you do find a data a solicitation, you want to follow it, you're already signed in. Uh, with SAM, if you're trying to do a search for entity information, you have to be signed in before it's going to pull up or it's just going to come back and tell you everything's, there's nothing there. 
All right, so we're gonna come back here, got my search. I wanna go into contract opportunities. And again, another little important trick tip is you don't necessarily have to, let me pull this fresh, right from just the word search, you can come down here without selecting a domain and just start entering search criteria. But if you start with picking your domain, your, your domain you're going to get a cleaner search. So just heads up on that. By changing the domain, it also helps kind of changes some of the filter information so that you can make sure that you're finding the right information. So if I'm looking for an entity, I can throw the name for the entity. I could put the entity name or the UEI just in my general search field, you know, from that home page. And honestly, it, the search is just, it's too much data, too many different directions. Um, the search is, it, it, it's just more, it's not as user-friendly. So again, long story short, select what you want to search. So we're going to come in here to contract opportunities. Now, since uh, Kim was kind enough to give me some examples, uh, let's start there. So when we're looking through that search, and if you remember, I'm like, what is the target? What do we want to know? Are we looking for a job? Are we looking for a specific activity we heard about? Are we looking to get glean some agency contact information? What is our point of sitting down at the screen and pulling up the software? So starting here, we're gonna come in here and we're gonna just say, right now, I wanna know what agency is buying emergency. Oops, you can laugh at me, Kim, because now I'm gonna signaling devices. There we go, typing is critical. So the nice thing with Sam is if we just throw the three word string in here, it's thrown it in quotes, that means it's going to be looking for that specifically. And eh, we only got four results, okay. So what is our issue? Is it too many words? We're trying to be inclusive. If we just do signaling devices, do we want to strip it down? Or possibly maybe we want to go into the NAICS system and find out, well, what is the NAICS code for that? The not so fun part about looking up NAICS codes, and as a side note, I do always recommend going to the US Census Bureau website um, you can see I just put NAICS code look up here and we get lots of companies and ultimately they're going to try to sell you stuff. But the Census Bureau is the federal agency that is responsible for this classification system and they really have a solid, robust uh, information search engine and you can see that they update this every five years. So if I come in here and I just start with emergency and we want to look down. So the way that the NAICS codes is built, uh, the hierarchy in which this is built, it always starts this three, the 30,000 range here is going to be our manufacturing into usage. So see here's some supply stores. We don't see very many retail codes. So if you do sell stuff as opposed to services, often you're gonna find yourself using manufacturing codes for defining your industry. And then we get down into services, and then we start getting centers, and then we get down into governmental. So if I'm looking at, and I'm just talking emergency lighting, so when we have this emergency signaling devices, how do we wanna define that? So this could be one, this 335, and if you click on it, of course, it's gonna give you a description and it's gonna break it down to other corresponding. And some of them even give you, well, maybe you want, here you go, your cross references. So this is a good way too, if you're trying to say, well, no, I don't want just lighting in general, emergency lighting, I'm looking for that signaling. So it's just kind of other communication equipment. So if we're coming in here in Sam and I'm like, huh, I'm only getting four results, we could simplify our search words. We can take the time to find some NAICS codes that we want to use. And in addition, we can look up the federal supply groups. So let me see if I can get something a little bit better. So if we get rid of this, and let me just start with sig signal signaling. 
typing and enunciation apparently aren't my strong suits today. So now if I'm just simplifying this, now I, yeah, we're going really broad. I went from four to 46. Ah, another tip and trick right here. After you've thrown in whatever your starting point that you are looking for, whether it's a keyword or NAICS codes, I really recommend because there's still a lot of old data that hasn't really been cleaned up from the FBO, the Federal Business Opportunity website when it was moved in here, gosh, pre-COVID days, so, you know, decades ago. Uh, but we still have a lot of things that aren't necessarily active inactive. The default is it's only going to show you active. If you come down here to your dates, and I just use the updated and say past three months or even past year, that's really gonna help strip out the older information. So now I had what, 25 before, I'm down to 14. The 14 is probably gonna be much more valid data for me trying to find this information. And of course you can sort by notice, title, relevant, uh, relevance, and I just kind of default to the updated date. So if we're coming in here, we're doing our search, we're looking at our keywords, and maybe signaling isn't enough. I could hop back over here. Again, you can see in the NAICS code. Oh, and heads up, the 2022 NAICS codes are live in the Census Bureau database, but haven't been fully incorporated into SAM. So with some of you updating your SAM profile, which is a whole nother topic for another time. Uh, you might have where your NAICS codes have expired and you can always come in here if you get some odd error message, put your NAICS code in under the 2017 and possibly cross-reference. So just heads up, those have changed, but they haven't been fully incorporated yet. Okay, so we have railroad signaling. So uh, here we go, glass break signaling devices theft, transform manufacturing. So we're not getting into that word emergency, but now we're starting to get some really good NAICS codes. And what I would do, which I am doing right now, is I would start writing some of these down. 3, 8, 2, 10, 3, 4, 2, 90. So we can see 23, that's construction. And if I don't think, I don't know, Kim, are you manufacturing or are you selling? Let me know in the chat box if you would. Oh, she's already given me a NAICS code. Look at that. She is on the ball with for me today. Thanks, Kim. Let me expand this a little bit here. Maybe not. Okay, manufacturing. 342290. All right. So we can come back in here into SAM, hop back over here, and I threw my keyword. So now I'm gonna come back down here and I'm going to go to, it always takes me a moment. Ah, here we go, product or service information. I keep wanting to look for the term NAICS code. So we have here NAICS code or product service. One of the things that you can do when entering the NAICS code, if we don't know for sure, is we can do a partial NAICS code. So you can kind of start seeing 3.3 is still bringing me up these manufacturing codes because it's showing you here at the end, end word each manufacturing. And then she had mentioned it was 3.3.4, computer and electronic device. So if I necessarily put all five terms, five digits in, then I'm getting very specific. But if we're trying to figure out how are the agencies defining signaling devices, then I recommend use less of the numbers. You can do the same thing here. You don't have to necessarily put the entire string, all six codes, uh, digits in when you're looking up here. So we can see it here, three, three, four. And now you can start seeing how it's broken down, computer, communications equipment. So you can see in bold, audio, summary conductor, other electrical. So we can even take this and do that partial and apply it back to the SAM site. Okay, so we have some NAICS codes, we have the signaling, and if we want, we can even talk about place of performance. Two different ways 
we can put in our state. And we're going to have this drop way back to no matches found. Remove it. And sometimes you can even throw the state code in as a keyword. We're still getting no matches. Not good news, Cam. We're not finding any immediate. Of course, we're down at fiscal year end too, and there's always the issue of the procurement cycle here in the state of Alaska. Um, but we could throw California, that too. But I do want to let you know, let me click the wrong one, uh, that you do get different search results if you're trying to limit to geographic area by putting state here as place of performance and occasionally putting in as a, the state in as a keyword. Uh, and it really comes down to whether the agency has defined a place of performance or not. So if it's a regional contract that's gonna be over multiple states, they might not have entered a place of performance data. And in that case, you're not going to come up under your search if we have defined a place of performance by state or by zip code. So just kind of keep that in mind. It doesn't hurt to try your search and hop between the two. All right, so we're gonna just grab this for move on before I run out of time. These two-way satellite time frequency transfer receivers. And I don't, yeah, probably not really what you're looking for specifically, Kim, but let's talk about how we're gonna take this data and find out that history. Cause this is some good information for us then to start looking backwards. So let's just assume for purposes of, of demonstration that, yep, this is exactly the type of thing that we are looking for. So let's break down our general information here. If you remember, I mentioned DODAC. So we can see usually DODAC is the string right before the year code. It's a little harder to tell that. It's probably not that full string, but definitely this NB688. And if we go down, to the contract information, we're gonna get that physical address. So see, that's Department of Commerce, the sub-tier, national, so NIST, National Institute of Standards, and it's under the Department of Commercial of Commerce for NIST. We have under our general information, letting us know it's most likely in Denver based on that time code. And what we care about now is this classification. So we did plug in a NAICS code, we already had that. But now we're looking at this product service code, the PSC. And sometimes you'll hear it as a federal supply group. So it's quite simple. And I should send that out to everybody. Um, if it is a number, it's a supply. And if it starts with a letter, it is a service. So let's say we are interested in the agency, but Really, we need to, this is just not, this next code isn't quite finding what we're looking for. We need to further define and break it down under that realm. It's close, but not quite. So if we take this next code and we're gonna hop over into FPDS with its Google-like search, and we're going to then gather some more data. I have a target in mind, I need to know is the federal agency buying these emergency signaling devices? If they are, how are they identifying which agency and who's getting those contracts? Oops, it would help if I would. Okay, so I'm gonna put my NAICS code in, get rid of that extra space and enter. And this is where the workshop next week, guys, I know I'm kind of stringing you along. I hope to get to spend some time with you next week on using FPDS where we're really gonna spend the entire hour on just this website. Step one, FPDS, get your single search term in. FPDS, anything that's underlined in blue, you're gonna build that search parameter. And we have our search criteria box over here on the right-hand side. And you can see right now the only criteria. The very first thing I always recommend is under the sort order, descending date signed. You see right now we're getting stuff in 2001, and although it doesn't seem like that was that long ago, that's too old when we're looking at for data. Okay, so just by doing sort order, descending date sign, it's just bringing the new stuff up top. Now, 
I said that my goal of this search is, again, we want to find those emergency signaling devices. And our next code is finding stuff, but not quite finding enough or the right stuff. So we're going to come in here. I've entered this, and I'm going to start looking at the PSC codes. So we saw, oops, sorry, guys. We saw <clears throat> in that solicitation, here it is. The agency here was nice enough to define the 6640 laboratory equipment and supplies, but it's not quite what we're looking for. So if we go into our results in FPDS and we know our NAICS code because it's our only search, we can start looking at these PSC codes and just scrolling down. Okay, laboratory equipment 6640, medical supply, and eh, not quite office supply, definitely not what we're looking for, radio. And do you see how we're getting all of these various PSC codes that are further breaking this down? Well, here we're starting to get into IT, information technology system configuration 7010. Maybe we want to add that back in. We can write that down as a subset. And we can actually even hop back over to SAM because we had those NAICS codes. We did 334. I'm hopping back and forth, so I keep losing it. But now we can come in here, this product and service code, and now I can get very specific. Oops, it helps if I use the right one. Sorry about that. Let me actually type in the right number. Okay, and you can see it's already telling us no results found. But we can get in here specifically. There we go. Let me clean up my previous mess. Well, obviously, if that's being found, and it's, of course, it's within the last year for Sam, kind of a rough time to show example as we're coming into that federal year end, and only looking at that four results but it just kind of gives you an idea. And again, what I could do is get rid of my keyword and then just base it off. And Sam's got some personality issues today. All right, don't count that as Sam is just being fun. Uh, but again, we can start seeing that information technology configuration. Another great thing to do is let's reverse engineer this. So if you have a competitor that is selling these devices or manufacturing, you know, you're a direct competitor, we can come into SAM, we can tweak our thinking, and I always just click on the top hat to get back to my home screen and kind of clear it. Uh, we want to look and see what that competitor is doing. We can come in here into our entity, into our domain, I want entity information, and then I can put in the, I'm gonna click entity again. I can put in a company name so I can find their unique entity identification. Somebody wanna volunteer a business name or your UEI if you have it. Show everybody your contracting activity that's going on here. All right, let's cheat it. So let's just grab, say, yep, this top one that we were really interested in, this wildlife computing company. Well, I have their UEI right here. Oops, that's their zip code, haha. <laughs> Some days the brain is slow. Here we go, unique entity identifier. So we have this information and I wanna know what they're doing for contracting. Well, because I'm already in FPDS, I could quite simply just click on that let the software and then just get rid of this. And now I'm only looking at this company's contract level. And I can see, again, because I'm still descending date signs, I'm looking at their current contracts, who are their contracts with? So they're doing a lot of business with Department of Commerce, a lot of business with Department of the Interior, Department of Defense, Smithsonian. And if you want to see who those sub agencies are, we can click on this Department of Commerce. And now you can see, oh, look, they're doing a lot of business with NOAA. And that might make a lot of sense if you're talking about the 
emergency signaling devices. So if this is one of our exact, you know, one of our competitors, we can come in here further, put in a place performance and kind of filter out where are they getting those contracts. Um, and again, I'll show you guys more how to do that next week. I want the company next week in case you can't tell, but we can come in here and it's giving us an idea. So who are they talking to the contracting agencies? Now, one of the things that I had mentioned, you know, we were talking about the GSA contracts and I'm running out of time and I haven't even talked about the state. All right, so <clears throat> move forward. Just by the way, if it has an IDIQ and the number, the contract number starts with a G, GS, then it's a GSA contract. All right. Let's hop back over because I am just talking too much thinking I have lots of time. And now I'm gonna power through slideshow from current slide. I'm gonna introduce you, I'm gonna take a couple minutes and just introduce you to state procurement. So the state of Alaska has their fabulous state of Alaska checkbook and you can go in and find a lot of that same type of information that we're trying to track down you can do in a smaller, uh, but it's easier to use in some aspects for the state of Alaska um, checkbook system. So here's just the state of Alaska purchasing. I What it is, is it's just alaska.gov. I'm right on their homepage. I've scrolled down. You wanna get to right under this where it has business. You've clicked on business and it brings you to this page. So alaska.gov business. And from here, you scroll down, here is all your state contract information product preference programs using our IRS vendor self-service, um, other premier procurement information, and of course the link for the state DOT website. Online public notices, it's not as easy to use. The search criteria isn't as robust as looking for something on contract opportunities, because you kind of, this, this site hasn't changed in well over a decade, um, but you can go in and kind of by location, not so much. They don't have any way of really doing subcategories under procurement. Uh, that's where using the IRIS system might be more beneficial, especially for supplies. But you can go in and look for posted activity for the contracting for the state. The, different, the biggest difference between state of Alaska for public notices where they're posting procurement activity are those dollar thresholds. So with the federal agency, once they hit, oh, that simplified acquisition threshold, they have to post it in the contract opportunities, even if that link takes you to another federal website. With the state, they don't necessarily have to post the activity until they hit that formal dollar threshold. So there's a lot the micro purchase level is a lot higher with the state than it is in the federal. So there is a lot of state contracting opportunity that happens where you really do need to build that relationship with those state departments and with those state buying offices because they don't necessarily post the solicitation packages or the bid packages until it hits a dollar amount to become a formal solicitation. That's not always the case, but it is something to think about. Uh, state DOT, again, for the procurement, and we are, this is where we're really going to start seeing a lot of the information on those IIJA, the Information and Job Infrastructure Job Act funds. A lot of great information doing business with the state DOT on their website. I just kind of grabbed it quick, and I apologize that I spent so much time, and I'm running out of time. And, of course, the Alaska checkbook. And what I'll do is I will work on developing a workshop on just how to use this information and take it back and kind of delve into it. But until then, they really do have this fabulous YouTube bit video that kind of talks about getting started. And the link from that, um, you can just Google on YouTube, State of Alaska Checkbook. I have the link here. So if you download the handouts, you can grab it. But it kind of talks about pulling the various summary and detail reports uh, and helps you where do you want to start for looking for that information. Uh, last but not least, if you guys can give me about one more moment, let's talk about municipality and bur borough purchasing level. And so I do have a few here, but obviously you can see just from the boroughs, from the map on the screen, not all of it. 
and I found all of these websites by simply putting in the borough name, like Bethel Purchasing, City of Bethel Borough, uh, Dillingham Borough Purchasing, and I was able to find. And don't forget about, you know, what is going on in our own backyard. Of course, we have the municipality of Anchorage purchasing right here. Other local purchasing, uh, University of Alaska, if you didn't know, the university has centralized their procurement uh, through all of the various state locations, Anchorage, Fairbanks, um, Southeast. It's all now one centralized under UA procurement, so they have a new website. Still have different buyers in different locations, but it's all under one director level now. And uh, the school districts are all considered government for purpose of PTAC assistance. The police department, fire department, all of that is, you know, take a look at what's going on near you. Real quick, closing out, contact information for PTAC staff. I rapidly ran out of time. I was hoping to spend more time playing in the websites. So we'll have to do that. If any of you would like to set up an appointment with any of us with the contract staff, uh, Carolyn, Craig, myself, Jacqueline in the Anchorage office, or in Fairbanks, we have Pierre and Cassandra. Oops, and they do have a new admin staff, uh, Kristen Sullivan, I need to add her contact information as well for the Fairbanks office. Feel free to reach out to us and let's set up. Oh, in fact, Kristen's, Kristen's online. See, I didn't forget forget you, Kristen. She joined us today. I see her signed in. She's going to have to yell at me afterwards, remind me to add her to our staff list. Uh, but reach out to one of us, let us know, set up an appointment and where we can do this much more specific to your business and help you walk through and find that information that you need as opposed to doing it as a generalized information throughout a webinar. Again, PTAC is always here to help. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining me today. I also want to apologize for running over. I really try hard not to do that. And again, if you need more information, feel free to reach out to us. And if you do want to go through this again, the webinar will be posted on our PTAC website, most likely uh, end of the week, if not definitely by next Monday. Thank you, everyone. Have a fabulous day. And thank you again for joining me here today.